Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. Can you demystify the first 10 questions? How important are they? Yes. Yes, that's an excellent question. So there is a, a myth out there uh, that suggests that the first 10 questions of the GMAT, of each section of the GMAT, are the most important questions, and therefore you should prepare to spend extra time on those first 10 questions because you want to get off to a good start. And uh, so that's false. That, so the short answer is it's false. It's not true. The longer answer is that because it's an adaptive test, the easier questions are going to have a much greater impact on your score than the hard questions. Now, are the, ten, are the first 10 questions more important? Well, if they're easier, then yes, they're more important because they're easier. So they're not more important because they're the first 10. They're just more important because they're easier. And if some of those 10 questions are really hard, then no, they're not important because they're hard. So really, that's the thing that determines the importance of a question. Now, unfortunately, none of us is qualified to determine whether a question is easy or hard in general. And you know, from the perspective of the GMAT, it's impossible for us to know whether it's easy or hard. Even for myself, I've been doing this as my full-time job for over a decade, and I'm still very frequently surprised when I find out that uh, you know, a question is considered to be a lot harder than I thought it would be, or vice versa. So, so if I can't determine the difficulty level of a question, I don't think any of my students can either. And even if you could determine whether a question is easy or hard from the perspective of the GMAT, how would that, how would that impact your strategy? I mean... Ultimately, if the question is easy for you, then you'll do whatever it takes to get it right. And if the question is too hard for you, then you'll guess and move on, regardless of whether the GMAT views it as an easy question or as a hard question. So even if you could make that evaluation yourself, it wouldn't help. It, it would just be a distraction. The good news is that the only thing that determines the, the importance of a question is how hard or easy is it is from the perspective of the GMAT. The bad news is we're unable to make that assessment, and even if we could, it wouldn't be helpful. So my advice is, if the question in front of you is a question that you can comfortably solve in, in or around 10 minutes, then you should slow down, triple check your work, read the question once more at the end to make sure you're answering what they asked and not what you thought they asked, and get it right. And if the question is over your head and you're not exactly sure how to go about it, then guess and move on. Don't waste your time on it. And these suggestions, these strategies don't care whether it's question number five or question number 25. It, do, it doesn't matter. And, and that's the advice. That's the optimal strategy. Now, I think the reason that this myth exists, that, that the first 10 questions are the most important, is because generally in life, the first impression is very important. Like if you're going on a date with a new person, that first date is really important because that's going to determine whether or not you get a second date. So you want to make a good impression. But on, say, the quantitative reasoning section of the GMAT, the first question, meaning the first date in my analogy, is not going to determine whether you get a second question. You're going to get 31 questions no matter what. So it would be like in the dating world if you were guaranteed that you're going to have 31 dates with this person, whether you like it or not. Well, that really takes the pressure off the first few dates. If you already know going into it, you're going to have 31 dates. The first impression doesn't seem that important in a scenario where you're guaranteed to have 31 dates. And maybe in some cultures, that's how it works. I don't know, you know, with arranged marriages and stuff like that, maybe you automatically know going into it that you'll have several dates and that takes off a lot of the pressure. So, uh, so that's the analogy that I would use when it comes to thinking about the importance of the first few questions in the GMAT. 
we come in thinking that they're extra important because in real life, the first impression really matters. But because of the way that in which the structure, the GMAT is designed, it doesn't. So the easier the question is, the more important it is. Make sure you get those right. And the hard questions are not going to impact your score at all, unless you're already scoring in the mid to high 700s. And then it does become about the number of mistakes that you make. So, you know, if you're... If you scored 750 last time and you're going to take it again because you want to try for a 780, then yes, it really matters how many mistakes you have. But I don't know many people in that position. Hey, I'm just going to interrupt my own video for a moment here. If you're finding value in this video, please let me know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. It really motivates me to keep uploading a new video every day. All right, back to the video. This is a big issue for a lot of people, and I'll, I'll ask you to let me know in the chat box if this describes you as well. For a lot of people, they go into the test with a sense that they have to get the first question right. I mean, the, just the thought that they might guess and move on on question number one would make their stomach turn. Like, it, it just seems so critically important to them, they must get the first question right. And let, let me know in the chat if that describes you, if this is something that you feel as well when you go in there. Like the, you have to get, it's like first impression, right? I have to make a good first impression on the GMAT and my performance on question number one will determine my performance on the entire test. Even if you know in your head that that's not true, Psychologically, we feel this immense pressure to get that first question right. And as Abhishek was saying, this is a really bad mind, uh, mindset to have going into the test because this test is stressful enough as it is. We don't need to add another layer of stress from thinking that we must get that first question right. So for a lot of students, in the past, I have suggested, especially students who seem to be more anxious, on the, on the more anxious side, I've suggested the following strategy, and maybe this will work well for many of you as well. Go into the test with a plan to just pick answer choice B on question number one, and really start the test from question number two. And by the way, I just chose B at random. There's no, it's not like answer choice B is better than the other ones. It's just good to know ahead of time what will be the answer that you pick. So you're going to start the test from question number two. That's the plan. If question number one pops up on the screen and you look at it and you realize, oh, this is actually fairly easy for me. I could do this pretty quickly. Then at that point, you're like, well, okay, fine. I'll do the GMAT a favor. I wasn't going to answer this question, but it seems pretty easy. I might as well just do it. And then my plan changes from picking B and moving on on question number one to picking B and moving on on question number two. Unless question two pops up on the screen and also seems fairly easy. Like, oh, yeah, I know how to do this one. Okay, so I'll do it, and then my plan shifts to I'll pick B on, on question number three and move on. And then question three pops up and, you know, rinse and repeat, same thing over and over again. You look at it, if it seems pretty easy, if it's not intimidating, okay, fine, I'll solve it. But the minute you get a question that you, you don't like the look of it, you just pick B and move on. And you feel great about it because that was your plan. So, I mean, what a great way to start the test. I had a plan to pick B and move on on question number one. And then I did exactly that. Everything is going according to plan right off the bat. Now I'm looking at question number two and I'm looking at the timer and I'm thinking, oh, this is so great. I'm already two minutes ahead of where I was supposed to be. I have two extra minutes now for the rest of the test. And that puts your mindset in such a great place for reasoning. I mean, ultimately what we have to do in this test is reasoning, and that's impossible to do if I'm in a state of panic. 
If, if I feel like it's me against the clock, I can't do good reasoning. And that's a human thing, right? It comes from evolution or the fight or flight response when a lion is chasing you in the savanna. You, you can't do reasoning in that moment. All the blood rushes to your muscles that, that are necessary in order to get you out of that dangerous situation. But you don't want that to happen at the GMAT because you need your blood in your brain to, to do the reasoning. So this is why I think the strategy is very effective because it, it takes you out of that mindset of panic mode. I have to get this question right into the opposite mindset of, hey, everything is going according to plan. I'm two minutes ahead. It's not me against the clock and I can just relax and do the best reasoning of my life for the next hour or so. And that's exactly the mindset that you want to be in. It's very hard for people, myself included, it's very hard to give up on a question on this test. It's very hard to admit defeat and to say, yeah, I don't know how to solve this question, I'm going to guess and move on. But I find that once you've done it once on the test, it's a lot easier to do it a second time and a third time and a fourth time. So it's really just that first time that we let go of a question that then makes it a lot more comfortable for us to do so again and again and again. Now, I think we all agree that it's necessary to be willing to let go of questions if we want to do well in this test. And we also all understand that letting go of a question does not necessarily mean that we're pushing our score down. It would only push our score down if it was an easy question. If it was a hard question, it won't affect our score to let go of the question. So one of the advantages of the strategy that I was describing is that it takes away the discomfort of letting go of that first question that you let go of because it's part of your plan. And then after you've already let go of that question based on your plan, it becomes a lot easier to let go of more questions, which is exactly what you want. You want to be uh, to have a great willingness to let go of questions on this test. And speaking of plan, like why is it so important to go in with a good plan? It makes me think of Michael Phelps, the Olympic swimmer, who had a plan that in the event that he dives into the pool at the beginning of the race and has a goggles malfunction, meaning his goggles fill up with water, it happens sometimes, he had a plan for that. He said, well, if that happens, I'm going to close my eyes so that the water doesn't bother my eyes and I'm going to count my strokes because I'm an Olympic swimmer. I know how many strokes it takes me to do one lap and I don't need to open my eyes to go in a straight line because I'm an Olympic swimmer. I, I know how to go in a straight line with my eyes closed. And so that was his plan. Now, without that plan, I think probably he would have had some kind of panic in the event of a goggle malfunction. But he had a plan, and guess what? It happened. He had a goggle malfunction at the Olympics, as the most important race. But he had the plan, so he did exactly what he planned to do, and he broke not only his record and not only won the race, he also broke the world record. So there's a new world record in that race where he had a goggle malfunction, and there's no way that would have happened if he hadn't planned for it ahead of time. So just giving you that as an example of how important it is to have a good plan going into a stressful situation. JD, you're saying you think your issue is the more I study, the harder it is for me to give up a question, especially if it's a topic I am have, uh, I have I've been practicing to improve. So uh, that's normal. Of course, if you've been practicing a particular topic and you feel like you've improved in it, and then that specific topic pops up in front of you, you're going to have a harder time letting go of it. But your decision on whether or not to let go of a question should not be based on the amount of effort that you've put into that subject matter. Your decision on whether to let go of a question should be based on how is it going. Right? You, you, so you're reading the question very slowly and very thoughtfully with a lot of pauses and you're doing a lot of digesting as you're reading it and you get to the question mark. How do you feel? Who cares what the subject matter is? Who cares how much time you've spent uh, practicing it? How do you feel right now? Do you feel comfortable with the situation that you're in? Is it looking good? 
I, I would argue that nine times out of 10, we have a pretty good sense by the time we get to the question mark how it's going. Like we have a pretty good uh, uh, intuition on whether this question is going to go well for us or not. So that's how you make that decision, not based on how much you've been practicing that particular topic. Based on my experience, taking practice tests, getting the first question right or wrong can be a matter of plus or minus five points in each subsection. Yes, so I want to address that. So NG is saying on this practice test, it seems like the first question really impacts the score. And I believe that, NG. I believe that that is true for practice tests. It will not be true for the actual test. And the reason why it has such a big impact in practice tests is because practice tests have a much shallower pool of questions to choose from when they're presenting you those questions. And this goes even for the official practice tests. They just don't have thousands of items to choose from the way that the real GMAT does. And so when you have a much shallower pool, your, your, the algorithm is going to kind of settle in on a particular region much earlier on in the test just because the, the, uh, the pool of items from which it can select questions is a, is a lot smaller. So this may happen on practice tests, it won't happen on the actual test. Even if it does happen, so let's say for a moment that that's true, that the, that the first question does impact your test more than others, the strategy that I recommended isn't any less effective as a result. Why? Because the strategy said, look, if the first question pops up and you feel pretty good about it and you know how to solve it, then fine, go ahead and solve it. I'm not saying blindly guess and move on question number one. I'm saying take a look at it. Your plan is to guess and move on, but you'll shift your plan to question number two if question number one is something that you can uh, comfortably uh, tackle. Uh, but what my strategy gives you is that freedom, psychologically, that freedom to uh, not worry about that first question and feel good about it and start the test from question number two. And that, I think, is very powerful. Deepanjan, one of my recent official mocks, I got 51 with four questions wrong. That surprised me. Uh, that surprises me as well. Uh, getting a 51 on quant, uh, I can tell you that on the, on the real test, when I got a single mistake in quant, my score was 50. I have heard of someone who managed to get a 51 with a single mistake, but I've never heard of a 51 with more than one mistake on the actual GMAT. So that is surprising. Uh, but again, official mocks are a bit different from the real thing because of the, uh, the fact that it has a much, they have a much shallower pool of questions. Uh, the 49, quant 49 with six mistakes is not surprising to me at all. That's, that seems a lot more normal. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.